I'm Ira Goldberg, welcoming you to a very special program dedicated to the Yiddish theater. <laughs> to help bring back those memorable, colorful years in our country's theatrical history, we are privileged and indeed honored to have with us three brothers who, together with their parents, lived and breathed the Yiddish theater. Jack is an actor and has appeared on various network television programs, such as Barney Miller, as well as other television specials. He's also a painter and sculptor, and has written a best-selling book about his father called My Father the Actor. Sam has chosen and perfected the art of sculpting, thus bringing to life distinctive Jewish characters that we've come to know and love. Sam's appearances at college campuses are always packed with young people listening to his fascinating experiences in the Yiddish theater. And then, of course, there's Herschel, star of stage, screen, and television. He continues to thrill audiences, young and old alike, as Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof, a character that will live forever. And, by contrast, Herschel portrays quite a different character on our late-night TV screens, namely Lieutenant Jacoby, Peter Gunn's friendly police protagonist. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the Bernardi brothers. Sounds good. Sounds Gentlemen, good. it's a real pleasure to have you here together to talk about the Yiddish theater. And what better way to start than at the beginning? Jack, uh, you're the historian of the period. Uh, where did it all start for the Bernardis? Well, for the Bernardis, uh, my father, uh, he uh, played Yiddish theater way back before the turn of the century in the eastern part of Europe when the actors were traveling by horse and wagon, you know, from state to state, you know, town to town. And uh, they played theater wherever they could find a place to play, in a barn, in a stable, in a hall. And uh, Papa used to tell the story to the kids that uh, one time the actors were traveling by horse and wagon. All day, all day they traveled. They came to a little village. And they, they were so tired that they, they decided to postpone it for the following night. But the villagers, they were adamant. They wanted a show that night, that night. So reluctantly, they put on a show. And there they were seated around in the center of the stage, utterly exhausted. And the leading lady was singing a plaintive lullaby to her child. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And one by one, the actors fell asleep on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. He told another story, another story he told. They were giving a performance with a blizzard outside, a blizzard. One man was in the audience. So they decided to call off the performance. But he protested. He says, I drove 10 miles with my horse and wagon here. I paid admission, and I demand the performance. So they saw he had a point, <laughs> so they put on a show. <laughs> For one person. Papa came here at the turn of the century, 1900, and he joined the Hebrew Actors Union down on the Lower East Side and became a member of the Hebrew Actors Union. So the president of the union at that time, by the name of Reuben Weissman, he said Papa, to my Papa, he said, uh, Bernardi, he says, uh, now that you're a union uh, member, he says, you should become a citizen of the United States. So uh, our father he took out his citizenship papers. And in due time, he was standing in front of the judge who asked him the inevitable question. Who was the first president? And he says, Reuben Weissman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a million stories about Papa. Yeah, I know. Uh, but from reading your book, it looks like the Bernardi family literally personified the wandering Jew. Can you paint us a picture of how the theater affected your family's life? We were gypsies. Yeah, exactly. We were gypsies. We were, yes, the wandering Jew, but we were, uh, we were uh, all actors are called gypsies. We were the uh, quintessential gypsies. We traveled, uh, I know when I was a child, because I was the last one to be born in the Bernardi family, mm -hmm. and I traveled with my mother and father and the, and the boys and, and my sister Faye. We traveled i went to 26 different schools when i was a kid that i think is is your key to the way we live yeah. we had a season in detroit a season in chicago a season in montreal and then we go back to brighton beach where we lived originally as a matter of fact jack has a funny story about when papa tell him that, well papa uh, we were we, i was born in manhattan right but 
Finally, he wanted a place where I could have some fresh air. Tell him. About what? Well, well, I, 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 well, I, I, I do like that. How do you like it? I never knew the story. I was a baby. We always <laughs> lived in tenement houses. In tenement yeah, houses. And finally had a few dollars saved up, and uh, he went down to Brighton Beach. Somebody, that was a summer resort in New York. And uh, there were bungalows there, bungalows. And uh, Papa was here 35 years in America. He fractured the English language. You know, he would go into a restaurant and say, uh, give me a steak well to do. <laughs> or give me a, an egg fried on the left side. You know, yeah. this kind of language. Two prunes with flomen. Yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, there were bungalows. So he came home on the, in, the, in, the, in the New York tenement. And uh, my mother says, uh, where were you? He says, I was in Brighton Beach, and he says, such pretty cantaloupes there. These were bungalows. Cantaloupes was bungalows to him. Anyway, we bought a cantaloupe, and we moved into a cantaloupe. <laughs> right? Yeah. All of us. And I remember Herschel, he was six months of age. He took sick with double pneumonia. And at that time, there were no wonder drugs, no penicillin, no streptomycin, nothing at all. And uh, Papa said, call the barber to put bunkers on. Right. Bunkers were little cups. The barber uh, at that time... time. Mm, no. Yeah. Bunkers yeah. are uh, these vacuum uh, glass cups that they, they suck... Uh, they, they burn them out, they burn it out, they take the oxygen out and they put it on your back and they the suck vacuum. up the skin. They pucker the skin and bring the blood to the surface. Yeah. The old-fashioned yeah. way of... And, of course, the barber did this because he was the uh, miracle doctor in those years. <laughs> no doubt. But we had our... We, we, well, uh, we, we considered him, you know, yeah. to put the bunkers on. Anyway, we had a regular family doctor, Dr. Manny, if you yeah. recall. And he came in, and uh, it was a crisis. At that time, it was a crisis. He had nothing to do but to wait. And uh, he used to charge $2 a visit. So, Papa called him into the kitchen, had a few words with him, and then the doctor left. He says, I'll be back in the morning. So I said, Papa, did you pay him? He says, yeah. So I says, uh, he says, uh, he says, I owe him $5. $5? I says, he always charges $2. He says, I borrowed $3. <laughs> <laughs> that was Papa. Yeah, Harvard. That was my But you all, you all played the theater, uh, with your uh, parents at one time or another, or together, didn't you? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Can you tell us some yeah. of the interesting, and I know there must be in fascinating stories that might have happened during that period that kind of illustrates the flavor of the uh, Yiddish theater and the people that were in it? Well, uh, I remember in Boston there was a, a Blue Nose Laws there. On yeah. Sunday, the curtain had to come down at 11 o'clock, whether the show was through or, or not. And to enforce the rules was the manager, the, the stage, stage carpenter, manager. the stage carpenter. Uh, the, the, no, it was uh, also yeah. the stage manager. Yeah. No, he was the, uh, the carpenter. Okay. State, no, he was the head carpenter. He was an Irishman. You know, Murray Callahan was his name. And 11 o'clock, he was standing at the, at the ropes, you know, the curtain ropes, chewing his tobacco. And the play wasn't over. And the company manager would rush over to him and say, Callahan, please, he says, another minute or two, he says, before the play is over. And Callahan would look at his watch, and he'd ring down the curtain at 11 o'clock. So obviously everybody disliked him. <laughs> disliked mm -hmm. him. So uh, there was also a Gary Society at that time who disallowed children to play on stage at mm -hmm. night. That was prohibited. And this Murray Callahan, he enforced these rules. So sometimes a Sam or I, we had to play a scene. Now, we couldn't go on with Callahan around, so Papa would go up to the dressing room, cut an electric wire, and call down, <laughs> Callahan, there's a wire up here. He says, busted, he says, there could be an accident. So Callahan would run up there, Sam would run on stage, do a scene, and come off. <laughs> Another time I had a scene, so you can't cut the wire every time. So he started a little fire at the stage door, and he had the fire extinguisher in his back. It's Callahan, there's a fire at the stage door. And he'd run over there and hand him the fire extinguisher. I'd run on and do a scene and come off. They kept getting away with that? Well, sure. sure. One time, had Pop, find a way. Pop and Mama were inveterate poker players. And several times a week after the show, they'd come up to the house and play poker. And one time, somebody informed them that police came and they raided. They raided the place and they took all the actors. They put them in the Black Mariah. 
in the van, and they yeah. brought him to the station house. It was a shanda, I mean, a shame. Actors are being arrested, Jewish actors being arrested. So they whispered to each other in the van, give false names, give false names. So they're in front of the sergeant. The sergeant says, what's your name? One fellow says, Cohen. Wasn't his name. He says, what's your name? He says, Berkowitz, but that wasn't his name. Called my father in front of him. He says, what's your name? Popped in his impeccable English. Callahan. <laughs> That's the only name I can think of. Yeah, Papa. Oh, what so a show picture of Papa. That's yeah. Papa over there. That's Papa over there. This is in the book. He's on the cover of your book, I know. And yeah. here he is in one of Sam's uh, figures. That's right. Sam, how about yourself? Uh, I know that uh, Jack's the historian, but I'll bet you have uh, quite a few story well it's not so much about the yiddish theater see i i ducked out of the yiddish theater when i was uh, very young i played children parts and then i said well there's not too much money here i'm going out to make a lot of money when i make a lot of money i'll go back to the theater in the meantime i found out that i could sculpt and the reason was because of my two brothers when i retired i came here to california from new york and we visited my brother Heshi's house, and he had a rabbi's head made out of clay, and he never took a lesson in his life. And then I went to Jack's house, and he had a rabbi's head made out of clay, and he never took a lesson in his life. And on the way home, my wife says to me, you know, if Jack can make a rabbi's head, and Heshi can, why can't you? <laughs> you know, I always said behind every successful man, there's a nudge. <laughs> and that's the way she nudged me, and I got some clay, and I made this. But one night, and when Hashi called me from New York when he went on Fiddler on the Roof, and that's how I really started. He says, Sam, you remember in the theater, in the Yiddish theater, sitting in a dressing room, all the shows were by Sholem Aleichem and Ash, Sholem Ash, and they're all about the Eastern European Jews, which is Fiddler on the Roof. He said, why don't you remember some of those characters and make them? And that's how I started to make, by remembering the characters in the Yiddish theater. Yeah. The first one I made, of course, was The Fiddler on the Roof. But this one is my father in a show called Chaim in America. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought of the show, which was a beautiful show, where he's supposed to come in from Europe and they send the kids down to Ellis Island to pick him up. And I remember, in, this was 3 o'clock in the morning, and I remembered seeing my father center stage when he came in, the spot shining in the curtain coming down. Chaim an American. He came in with the satchel with the bundle on the back. And three o'clock in the morning, I got up and I took some clay and I made it. Mm. It's now the highest hazard in uh, New York and the Jewish Federation. I made a three-foot piece for them because it's an immigrant. It's the immigrant. But all these characters that I make are from the Yiddish theater. Except that one over there is Heschel when he played in a show here in, the, in California called Goodbye People. But mm -hmm. this, that was Max Silverman, you remember yeah, that? Yeah, that was a beautiful, that was him. exactly like yeah. the character. He played a 72-year-old man, and he used to come to me and say, Sam, how does a 72-year-old man walk? Mm -hmm. Because I was 72 at that time. <laughs> yeah. And this, of course, is Tevye. But <clears throat> as a child, as you said, and as Jack said, we all played in the theater. Uh, and we were, we, you know, the dressing room was like our nursery. Mm. And we were, we, yeah. mm. we, we, we reacted. They, they needed a kid. They said, get one of the Bernardis. Because we were all two, three years b between us, except Hesh. He became <laughs> 13 years later. But that's another story. <laughs> that's another story. I want to I wanna talk about that story. We will. We'll talk about and, it. Anything uh, you want, we'll talk about it. No, Jack just reminded me of a, a story when... I was a little, when I was a baby, I was about three, five, four years old, and my mother had me on stage, and she was whispering to me, you gotta cry. And I said, I can't cry unless I'm hurt, you know? And she pinched me, so I cried. <laughs> That's how it worked. <laughs> but uh, when he was known. That's method acting. Sam was known to us uh, because he left early. And when I was born, I didn't know Sam that well because Sam wasn't home. 
when I was around, when I became cognizant of anything. Sam wasn't there, and I said, what does he do? Well, he works for the government, and he does this. I said, what do you mean? And there's an apocryphal story that's not a true story. I don't know. Is it a true story? Because I don't remember this. But when Sam came home from school, he said he was good in arithmetic. Yeah. He was good in, in, in math. Yeah. And he said, my teacher thinks I should be an accountant. And my father got very angry and slapped him and said, you'll be an actor like yeah. the rest of us. Yeah. 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 And the truth is that he became uh, a math, you know, a major, and he, and he he studied all that stuff. He, he got a job with the government. He was, ended up being a payroll master at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we considered him the white sheep of the family because <laughs> none of us were making a living. Mm. We were just running around the country. The white sheep of the family. The white sheep. We called him that for <laughs> years. I remember <laughs> Sam, the white sheep of the family. And I go to his house. You know, family with children, and that. you know, he was a, a whole different animal. What it is was it? like where did he I come from? I was an industrial engineer. Yeah. I wound up. You were the only one in the family that got. Literally out of show business. That's right. Literally. Right. Yes. Literally, right. yes. That's right. Then I said, when I retire, I'll come back. I'll go to Hollywood. My two brothers are big stars here. He was in Peter Gunn. <laughs> he did. And he was doing back. a lot. And I said, I'll get back to the theater. <laughs> was, and it so happened, I didn't. I found out I could sculpt. And in effect, I'm back in the theater because I go on lecture tours and I talk to mm -hmm. 200, 300 people. We all do the same act. Mm. And we all <laughs> and we all right. the same story. We right. end up telling the same joke. Going to a certain true city. Now. Says, ah, we heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother was here. Ah, he was here. <laughs> it's so true. No, yeah. But uh, yeah. but you talk about leaving uh, California. I know Jack in his book tells the story about Boris, your brother that oh, uh, uh, went there. And I and I'd like to. I wish you could tell our uh, viewers that story because that's yeah. really great. About Boris, you know, Boris. Uh, we. Uh, we never had a telephone in the house. Whenever there was a, at the corner candy store in those years, a call, they'd call the candy store, the people, and then they'd come over, send somebody over, knock on the door. Bernardi, there's a telephone call for you. We'd go to the candy store. Finally, Papa put a phone into the house. And uh, at the end of the month, he gets a bill for $50. He hit the ceiling and says, who called for $50 to South America? Somebody was making calls from our house. He says, he says, I don't know anybody. I got an aunt in South America, but I haven't seen her since I was a kid. She was in Europe. Now that she lives in Argentina in Buenos Aires, but I never saw her. They'll write to her. Who would call her? Well, it turned out that Boris was negotiating with South American theaters down there to bring in, represent Yiddish stars from the United States to bring to Buenos Aires. And he was making these calls and he closed the deal. Well, when Papa heard that, he pulled the phone out of the house. Mm. That was the end of that. But Boris got the job, see? Mm. And yeah. then he took his suitcase, and he says, goodbye. He said, I'll see you soon. Soon. He didn't <laughs> see him for three years. <laughs> he, he went to South America. So before he went, my father said to him, look up Aunt Sarah. Aunt Sarah was married to some fellow who they came from the eastern part of Europe. And... Uh, there was a quota coming into the United States. Some couldn't come in under the quota, so they came around South America. And if some, if they waited long enough, possibly they'd get into the United States. And some of them settled in Mexico, in, Ar in Argentina, Brazil. And Sarah uh, and her husband uh, settled in Argentina. They went into the real estate business, and they were very successful. So they decided to remain there. And eventually, uh, Sarah's husband passed on. And she was a very shrewd businesswoman, this Aunt Sarah. And uh, she heard that the red light district, which was legal in Buenos Aires, was a thriving business. So she gave up real estate, <laughs> and she bought a string of brothels. And she became a very <laughs> famous madam in Buenos Aires. Boris didn't know that. He looked up Aunt Sarah, thinking she was in real estate. And when he found out what she was, and she embraced him, she says, Boris, anything you want, anything you want. He knew what he wanted, you know. <laughs> that was sweet answer. <laughs> Who, after she died, she left money for my father. And he always says, that sweet Aunt Sarah, she's a wonderful woman. <laughs> he only knew what she was. <laughs> that was uh, Boris in South America, remember? That takes it, well, that takes us back to the... Uh, that takes us back to Brighton Beach because so many yeah. of uh, the stories that you do tell, and I know everybody, your recollections yeah. would go back to that. And 
uh, it's not just the stories in Brighton Beach, but the people that you met while you were on the road. And uh, but I'd like to I'd like to talk a little more about what life was like back in. Well, let me tell you, uh, uh, Brighton Beach, the well, Brighton, Bernardi Hotel. The Brighton Beach. It's funny that you know, I I suggested previously to Jack that he tell the story about Papa buying this house in Brighton Beach. Jack told the story and got away. Di digressed to another story. But the, what I asked him to tell was Papa said, listen. We should be healthy. The baby should be healthy. That was me, because I came 13 years later. The baby should be healthy. We'll take, get fresh air, and Brighton Beach will buy a bungalow, a cantaloupe. Okay. And he went, and we bought that, and immediately, the minute we got to Brighton Beach, I caught pneumonia. That's the yeah. point. That's the point was everybody was healthy, and I got sick. From the damn air. Oh, that's the point. So yeah. I, that's what I thought he was going to tell. Happen. It was this yeah. irony. Yeah. Brighton, what did you want me to tell? What about, Bar what about Brighton Beach? What? Uh, about that it was a Hotel Bernardi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We called it. Oh, yeah. We called it the Bernardi Hotel, because we were living in a, in a street of what we call private people. The reason we call them private people, the audience, is because we're public people. We're on display. Yeah. And we were. We were in 3rd Street, Brighton 3rd Street. We had an open porch, you know, a screening porch. And we had a piano out there. He played the violin. My sister Faye played the piano. We all sang. And that's how we'd entertain ourselves and other actors, broken down actors, this kind of the cops. All the police came in at, on oh, their yeah. duty, and when they walked the beat, they'd come in and have coffee. Come on in. There was 24-hour food and drink going on, coffee and sandwiches and entertainment. And the neighbors would gather outside and watch and listen and applaud, and we'd be the entertainment for the, right. for the whole no, area. Not we. Yeah. The what? star was Hershey. He was, well, I was a little yeah. kid. Two you know, years, Mama well, sing. two years old. Three o'clock in the morning, she'd sing. bring him down from upstairs. Mm -hmm. He was asleep. Yeah. Wake sleep. him up and bring him down, put him in the high chair, and he'd sing. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it was, it was a very right. gratifying yeah. period because I got nothing but applause, yeah. and it yeah. was addiction. I'm yeah. addicted to it. Mm. I yeah. need right applause now. <laughs> but I remember it as a kid. The neighbors used to complain about the noise. People had to get up, oh, yeah. so they called the police, and the police would come over and knock on the door. We uh, got a report that there's a disturbance here. So Papa says, "What kind of disturbance?" He says, "Come on in, <laughs> have a <laughs> coffee, him in, have, mm. have a sandwich, a salami sandwich, a sardine sandwich, coffee." He sat down, he listened to Yiddish songs, <laughs> and when they <laughs> come, and I was there. I mean, I remember this. I was about six or seven years old. I remember the police were sitting there and having coffee, and there was a complaint from the next door person who was yelling, at, I'll call the police. Says, what can I do for you, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was so yeah. ultra. It was a lovely, it was wonderful. Yeah. No, why did they call it the Bernardi Hotel? Because not that they just came there. They came and they slept. We used to put two chairs together oh, to sure. make a bed. They slept on... I got up in the middle of the, uh, one morning, and there's a guy in in the kitchen ironing his pants. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. I guy. says, "Who's that?" <laughs> and my brother yeah. Boris says, "He's a friend of mine." I uh, you get well, one of the things we had, which was uh, sort of delightful for you know as I, as I was growing up, were these unemployed actors, and they always had the same line. You know, it was 45 to an hour from Manhattan or from any other part of, of yeah. New York to get to Brighton Beach, is the tip of New York. It's far away for people. And they'd walk in if they happened to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> they wanted a meal. They wanted a free meal, and we gave it to them. Mm -hmm. We were broke, too, by the yeah. way. We had no money. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was Community that's poverty. That's right. Yeah. But that's what gave your father the idea to uh, open the delicatessen? Oh, that, oh, yeah. oh, that business. He figured that all what these actors would uh, come in. Yeah, and, uh, my father opened money. a couple of businesses and went yeah. broke. Yeah. Yeah. Went broke in a couple of businesses. It was what? a terrible Tell us, it was tell us about the Jack can tell you the story. The delicatessen <laughs> across the street there. Well, that's after he retired. He got no, sick. This he is a, the, uh, a neighbor of ours. He was the instigator. He said, Bernardi says, I could get a bargain for you. The guy is not doing so well, but you, an actor with all your friends, your actor friends, you'll, you'll make a fortune there. And he listened to him. He bought the, the, the delicatessen. <clears throat> and of course, the first night it was jammed. All the actors came down, wish us luck. So they used to come and eat in our house, see? But now <laughs> in the opening night they came, <laughs> they ate, you know, and they had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Second night the place is empty. Place mm -hmm. is empty. Third night they're coming into the house now. <laughs> and they're saying to my mother, well, how about some coffee? She says, go to the delicatessen. She <laughs> says, we got a delicatessen. <laughs> well, we died there. <laughs> it was terrible. So this instigator who who made him buy the, the store. He gave him an idea. He says, you want to sell the store? He says, how can I get rid of it? He says, put an ad in the paper that your wife is sick, that the doctor said she needs dry air. So he put an ad in the paper, <laughs> reluctantly. So he invited all the actors to come down to eat free of charge. The place was jammed. 
And this is, this future buyer walks in. He sees a jammed restaurant. They're doing business. Everybody's busy there. And he bought the restaurant. Yeah. The second night was empty again. <laughs> Pop had, uh, had invited all his friends uh, down. For Kramer, nothing. I remember yeah. he changed the name to Kramer's Delicatessen. You know, yeah. Kramer's Delicatessen. Pop, of course, felt terrible. And later on, we Could saw that the fixtures were being taken out. He was closing up, and inadvertently, he bumped into my father. See, I, my father felt terrible about it. Mm. He says, I thought you said your wife had a go to have some dry climate. He says, the doctor made a mistake. She needs, she needs wet climate, he thinks. <laughs> Yeah. You want to hear stories about the theater? Is that yeah, I, yeah. What going theater? back Which to well, anecdotes, to anecdotes from the golden age of the, the golden age was what? I you mean, mean Adler or was the Yohan Tomaszewski? When there were, were many the golden, golden ages. ages. There when were two it? golden ages actually. Two. You know, at the well, I was I was in the tarnished yeah. age. You you were in the second. Uh, no, the third. I was in the Gshun Theater. When the when the when the, the first the immigrants came out with the, the actors followed the immigrants and they had real Yiddish theater. And that's when Adler and Tomaszewski and uh, Bert Kessler. Kalish yes. and Kessler, those people, yeah. those are the great actors. They did yeah. Shakespeare in Yiddish. They did all the great oh, authors yes. in Yiddish. And uh, there were Yiddish authors, original Yiddish authors. And then, well, you want to tell it? Or you, well, anyway, oh, well, I oh, came sorry. into the area. Uh, after that, they began to do musicals to keep up with America. See, they began to do these, these uh, all kinds. Of, that's when Menasha Skolny came in and, and others. They, 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 yeah, Molly Picken. Then there the, the, the was a hot throb, which was more on another level. It was a level of the, the less educated people, the people who just wanted to sit for four hours and laugh and, and cry and have fun. I came in later when the young element, or the, the children of the immigrants, were now trying to Americanize themselves. They were changing their names. They were doing everything to get away from being Jewish, or at least from being immigrants' children. They wanted to move uptown, get out of the ghetto, become Americans. And at that point, the Yiddish theater was trying to hold on to them. They yeah. couldn't speak Yiddish that well. They didn't speak Yiddish at all, some of them. So the Yiddish theater began to change themselves to speak English. And the great stories come out of that period because they spoke broken English. They couldn't speak English. But they yeah. tried to hold on to the audience by saying words, you know, ich bin our boy, full of fun and joy. Ich liebe alle Maiden in Italy. Ladies, ladies, I love you so. The Shenste is our. Oh, come on, let's do it. Wow. <laughs> come on, let's do it. Because that's a, a good example of that period when I came into the Yiddish theater. It was a, a English theater. It was not quite Yiddish anymore. It was half English, half Yiddish to hang on, but it was a failing process. Well, well, tell well, them the story about, about the assimilation that the, the Jews had. They changed their names, you know, their, their surnames. And yeah. the fellow changed his name from the That's sweet a joke. Well, 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 so, no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the guy, that's an old joke. Right? Ayyidin yeah. Dazabud. You know Ayyidin Dazabud? You know. Mm. You don't understand. Ayyidin mm. Dazabud is a Jew with a beard like this. Actually, you know? Know. And he's introduced to another man. He says, I want you to meet C.D. Allen. He says, Allen. That's your name? He says, that's right. Hmm. He says, where did you get a name like Allen? He says, well, my original name is uh, Krachmalnikov, but I'm standing under a street. Uh, under a street uh, sign, and all around me, people are changing their names. I said, ah, I'll change my name too. And I looked at the street sign, it said Allen Street. So I changed it to Allen. He says, Allen, oh, Allen Street, Allen, that's not... Where do you get the CD? He says, Corner de Lancey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how he got his name. But that's his, you know, that's, mm -hmm. there are stories of legion about that period of assimilation. But yeah. you cut your nose off. I'd like to you, you add... Cut, you cut your name off. I'd like yeah. to add with what uh, Herschel said and sort of... Uh, flesh out, you know, the beginning of the theater when they first came over here, you know, at the, the turn of the century, where the, the uh, Jews in the eastern part of Europe, they were persecuted, you know, before the turn of the century, mm -hmm. and uh, oppressed with pogroms, and by the time 1914 came around, close to two million Jews, you know, came to the promised land, the land of Columbus, where the streets uh, were supposed to be paved with gold. And they came here and they spread all over the United States. And wherever the, uh, the, uh, the Jew went, the actor followed, and they opened up a theater. It was a meeting place for the, for the, uh, you know, for the Jews. For the, uh, yeah, the social for the center. Yes, it's a social center. And uh, they, would, they would play historical uh, operettas and lurid melodramas and vaudeville catering to the taste of these uh, Jews. And they loved the Yiddish theater. They'd come two and three times a week, you know, to see their favorite actor, to meet with their friends, you know, the shopkeepers, the peddlers, and so forth. And they were great critics. These people were great critics. 
they would watch the show, you know, and they would mm. laugh uproariously at the antics of the comedians, you know, and then they shed copious tears at the highly dramatic moments. And after the show, they'd fry out, and one would say to the other, well, what did you think of the show? Shrug his shoulders. Ah, piece of rag. That's <laughs> <laughs> my but, but they were They were very involved. With the, with the theater. Your, but your yeah. parents and you followed these people or went to where they were and we all went the to different where they cities. Were. Yes. Yes. We yeah. went to where they were. Where did you go? Yeah. What, well, uh, all over the, wherever, where? Where, as a, the outpost of the Jewish population, where there was enough people to do a week. Or mm. we, we hoped for a season. Sometimes you had a split season, sometimes you had weeks. You know, the last, uh, the 30s, it was a depression. That's there weren't that many people who can afford to go to the theater. This was during your time, you know. I'm talking about but during yeah. our time when we were just the four kids before you came. They spent years. Yeah. We spent the season. We spent no, the season. That, didn't you? No, 36 weeks was the season. Papa raised four children, you yeah. know. 36 weeks, we'd go to Chicago, we'd go to Boston. You know, like my mm -hmm. like you know. said, we all had... 15, 20 tra transfers from different schools. Yes, we always went to mm. different well, schools. Several different schools. schools. We went from city to city, different schools. But I remember that in Milwaukee, Papa took upon himself to uh, uh, lease a theater out there, the Rose Theater in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee. Milwaukee. And in the company was a fellow by the name of Muni Weisenfreund, who many, many years later became the famous Paul Muni of the movies. At Scarface mm. and a fugitive from a chain gang. Mm. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, uh, Milwaukee was a Germanic uh, uh, town. And the Jews who lived there were German Jews. And very few Ashkenazic Jews. And the theater just couldn't uh, pay the expenses. So Papa eventually had to uh, give up yeah. the theater. But he still had the lease. We children used to play theater in the attic of our home. This was in 1960. 1960, about. 1960. Was this the golden age, then uh, 1960? Yes, in, in, yes, in New York, in New York City, which was the center of the Yiddish theater, where Tomaszewski and Adler and Kessler played. And uh, as, uh, as Herschel was saying, they did adaptations of the classics, where the more sophisticated, uh, educated Jew was able to see Shakespeare and Ibsen, and Chekhov and Tolstoy. In Yiddish. In Yiddish. In Yiddish. In Yiddish. Oh, I, would, wonderful, I would say it was a 40 wonderful year chapter. history. 40, a wonderful chapter. Right? Jack, more than that. About, no, what, what, when did it start? Maybe about... Uh, 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 oh, it uh, started in 1876 in yeah, Romania. Okay. It's 50 years. By the father of the Yiddish theater, Abraham Goldfarb. Goldfarb. So, anyway, I, I want to tell this little story here about Milwaukee. So, my father uh, paid off the actors, but he didn't have enough money to pay them the full salary. And he paid this uh, Muni Weisenfreund. Uh, salary less three dollars. So when he says, Bernardi, where's you owe me three dollars? He says, I'll pay it to you. He says, when? He says, oh, please. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you sometime. I'll pay you. Many, many years later, when he was a big, big star, Herschel, as he grew up as a small child, he was called the, the Wunderkind, you know, Wonder Child. He was brilliant as, a, as an actor, as a child. That's true. And they did a play <laughs> at the National Theater on the Lower yeah. East Side. Uh, I forget the name. Zwei Herzen. Zwei Herzen. Two Hearts, yeah. which was an adapted from the picture The Champ, which starred Wallace Beery and Jackie Cooper. Cooper, Cooper yeah, yeah. And Herschel played. He was nine years old. He played the part of Jackie Cooper. He was brilliant in the role. I, I, I remember Papa. I was playing in Newark at the time. And Papa came to know, he says, you've got to go see Herschel. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And I went to see him. He was brilliant. And, and he was so at home on the stage. I remember one particular scene where the star, his father, comes in. And uh, he says, well, let's go to bed. And he's in bed. And uh, Goldenberg, who was his father, he was a very fine actor, went over to the switch. And he pressed the switch. Now, the electrician is supposed to dim the lights. And he missed the cue. And the lights didn't go off, so there's a titter out front. Herschel, the nine-year-old kid, he says, Oh, I tell you, those electricians, I asked them, uh, you told them to come up to fix it. They never did come up. There was such an applause in the audience, they realized it was an ad-lib line, you know? <laughs> He's brilliant. Anyway, uh, Muni Weisenfreund, who was then Paul Muni, a very wealthy star of Hollywood, he came to the National Theater to see this play, and Papa was there. Well, they hadn't seen each other for years, and they, 
They embraced and they fell over each other like long-lost brothers and they talked and they wept. And when they left, Papa put some money in his hands. And Paul Muni, the wealthy artist, says, Bernardi, what is this? It's the three dollars I owe you from Milwaukee. <laughs> How many years later was that? Well, well, this was from 1930 uh, to 30, 32, was it? 17 32? to 32, yeah. 17 to 32. Yeah. It's it's 25, 15 years yeah, later. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful story, huh? Yeah. 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 No interest. Papa, Papa, he was a great ad No interest. Papa was a great ad <laughs> You know, Papa Pop was, went on a stage. We had an actress who always upstaged the actors. Oh, yeah. You know? this was, yeah. And uh, an actor would come in and she would move tables around, she moved the chairs around. So the actor, in order to talk to her, had to turn his back to the, to the audience, see? And this is the way she upstaged him. So my father had a scene where he came in, and she immediately started moving the furniture around, rearranging the chairs and the hat rack up there. And Papa didn't say anything. And she turned to him, she says, did you want to say something? He says, I see you're moving. He says, well, I'll come in tomorrow. <laughs> walked out. Walked out the train. Right, walked. Another time, he, he, had, he was supposed to come in, make an entrance. The actors were on stage, and he heard his cue, and he wanted to come in. He tried the door, but it was jammed. The door was jammed, he, and he forced it. Wouldn't, it wouldn't open. So in desperation, he climbed through the window. So the actor stood there amazed. He came through the window. So my father, he, said, he explained. He says, it was such a warm night. He says, I thought I'd walk up the fire escape. <laughs> I never heard that. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> well, ad-libbing and bloopers, and uh, yeah. bloopers, you know, are very big today, but I'll bet that uh, they really took on Not some so significance. <laughs> Any, anytime you have theater, sure. you're going to have a blooper, you're going to have mistakes. But and some of the great, uh, I, I don't know, Sam, do you do you recall any, in while you were playing the theater, any real no, you blooper never, story? The, uh, Tom, to, to tell about the... Uh, what? But that actor who was a master of bloopers. Yeah, what was his oh, name? Honey, oh, we don't say names, yeah, do we? Yeah. That actor. Yeah. That, act that actor. That actor, right. Yeah. Yeah. Erase that from the soundtrack. That actor. Yes. Yes. That yeah. actor. We don't tell mention the uh, Which one? What? There's about a million of them. Yeah. Well, he says, he's supposed to say, he's, he's, he's a father, and he's, he's arguing with somebody. Who's he arguing with? Another actor. Another actor. No we names. don't name. No names. No names. <laughs> and he, his mind was never quite were there. He, 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 his mind was always somewhere else. He was an absent-minded actor. Whatever. So whatever was in front of him, that's what he would talk about. And he was supposed to say, I'm a father of five grown children. And he, he was gesticulating with his hand. And he said, I am a father of five grown fingers. <laughs> children. <laughs> I mean, that's, that was the kind of actor. What did he do? Oh, in the Dibok, which is a great classic. It's a messenger from God. And he played that part. And he's supposed to lift the lantern at the time when a dibuk possesses the body of the, of the bride, the spirit, this evil, or this dead spirit, possesses her. And she comes out with the voice of a man, her lover, her former lover who has died, the ghost. And, and the messenger of God, played by this actor, <laughs> raises, his, raises his lantern and says, Into the bride has entered a dibuk. And everybody around is standing with these tall black tapers, right? And they go, <gasps> They have all these tall candles, right? And he, the cue comes, and he raises the lantern, and he looks, and he sees all these candles. He says, into the bride has entered a candle. <laughs> the, 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 curtain the, curtain came down. the curtain came down, because oh, they wouldn't wait. Yeah. They wouldn't wait for him to correct the line. He, he was late for performance one time. <laughs> what? So he jumped into a taxi. He says, old field four, seven, six, nine, two. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> His, unfortunately, his wife died, and uh, every God. Jewish uh, actor or actress <laughs> was uh, prepared by Schwartz's. Uh, Shh, no names. Mm. Well, Schwartz's what? Well, that's, that's a plug for him. Schwartz's that's funeral right. Schwartz's parlor. Funeral parlor. Yeah. Yeah. Schwartz's funeral parlor at that time. So uh, he meet one of the uh, actors. He says, "Don't forget tomorrow, ten o'clock, Schwartz's beauty parlor." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, so he was a wonderful actor. He was a good actor. Yes. That actor. One time he played the, you know, a period play? A period play. Oh, you're telling me. And he was wearing uh, this uh, wig, you know, with the long curls. And, uh, Feathered hat. And then he had a, he was off stage for a while, so uh, 
It was a very warm night, so he was up in the dressing room there, and he took his hat off with the feather in it, you know, and he took this heavy wigged uh, wig off, and he put it down. They're playing cards, and they called him, come, come, it's your cue. So he was in haste and haste, so he he forgot to, forgot to put the hat on, but he put the... He, he put the wig on, see, and he forgot yeah. the hat. And he ran down, and the queen was there, her majesty, you know. And he came in, and he took his wig off. Your majesty. <laughs> Your majesty. He was bald headed. Your majesty. <laughs> took the wig off. Well, that was the bloopers. Well, uh, it wouldn't be complete without the uh, story about the Miller and the uh, Bronx Express. I mean, you oh, know that? That's, uh, that's, no, that's, oh, that's a great story. Oh. This actor over, he played at the Bronx Art Theater. And it was right close to the 180th Street uh, Express train. And uh, at 180th Street, the last train leaving that station was 12 midnight. If you don't get that midnight train, you miss the Express. And you have to walk from 180th to 174th Street where you get the local. Now, he lived in Brooklyn. If he got the express, he gets there in 45 minutes. If he misses the express, he takes the local. He has to walk to 174, take the local, which would take him two hours. So in order to get that express, before the curtain came down in the last act, he saw to it after the second act, he would get his, take his makeup off, put on his street clothes, <laughs> and when the curtain came down, he never took his bow, you know, he never took a curtain bow. He ran out the stage door, up the steps, and got that Bronx Express. Immediately, she'd get home. So on one uh, particular night, performance there, it was a wintry night, terrible wintry night. And uh, after the second act, he took his makeup off. And it was very cold outside, and he wore spats at that time. He wore spats, he put spats on. But in the play, it was summertime, so, and he played the part of a doctor. So he made his entrance with the spats and a straw hat. <laughs> and he's the doctor. And the leading lady says, uh, oh, uh, good afternoon, doctor. He says, good afternoon. And she says, uh, sit down. And they had a little dialogue. And then finally she says, would you care to have a glass of tea? And he says, mm, of course. And she says, John, to the butler, two glasses of tea, please. But the actor was playing John. He was up in the dressing room playing Pinato there. Yeah. He forgot his cue. He didn't yeah. come in. Now he's looking at his watch. He's worried he's going to miss that Bronx Express. <laughs> and she says, I understand, doctor, that you're going to South America doing research on yellow fever. He says, yes, yes. He says, where's that guy? He's with the tea. And now he doesn't show up, so they have to do a little ad living there, and they talk. And she says, well, I understand. You're sailing, huh? You're sailing to South America. <laughs> To do research, right? He says, yes, tonight, my dear, on the Bronx Express. It's truly what? dedicated act. Yeah, that's, that's that's one great story. <laughs> What do you want to know, Ira? What, 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 what else? What do you want to know? Ira? Well, I want what to know else? a little Speak bit up. about you, Sam. I, yeah. That's what I, I want to know. What? Well, uh, I was. I, why I, did you leave? Why did you? I leave left it? because there was, was no love. money in it. He was in love. I was in vaudeville. Yeah, see, I got you out know, of the theater theater. for money. You're in there for love, aren't you? I, I went into vaudeville. Yeah. I went into vaudeville with my older brother Boris. We had an act like uh, Abbott and Costello comedy act, and. Uh, then the talkies came out, and we couldn't do it. Everybody was going to nightclubs, and we didn't have that kind of an act. So I said, look, I'm quitting, because I can't, I can't, we can't make any money. There was no money there. And the Yiddish theater, I had stopped it with the Yiddish theater when I, I got married very young, see, and I walked away. Anyway, uh, I went, and I, I, I went out and got a job because I wanted to make money. He went in the front theater as a, a treasurer and then as an agent. And he was a... A, a Boris. A, a, yeah, Boris, my older yeah. brother. My older brother. Yeah. My older brother. And uh, he took, you know, Molly Pickin, Maury Schwartz on the road. And he took them to Buenos Aires and places like that. And I just stuck around making money, trying to make money. And I said, someday I'll get back to the theater. And that's how I got out of the theater. But so up till the age of maybe 18, 
I was away after the age of 18 or 17. I went away. He stuck to the theater right from, from here all the way up. He did the same thing. My sister did the same thing. Except Boris and I went out of it, but he stuck with the theater, as I say, as a manager. As a manager. As a yeah. company as a manager. Company manager. Yeah. And he took big shows on the road, you know, like uh, Hello, Dolly, and Promises, Promises, and so on, mm. before he passed away. So uh, the only <laughs> recollections I have of the Yiddish theater was when I was a kid. Mm. And because of him telling me to remember the Yiddish theater so that I could do the sculpture work, that's what I started to remember. And then all these stories came back to me. All these, see, I used to sit in the dressing room like they did and watch the makeup and everybody, these were Eastern European Jews. Everybody had beards. And I used to watch how they made beards and that's how I sculpt. I did the same thing because I'm not a sculptor. So I just put a beard on with, with clay and I made it just like the people did. But they come out very natural and uh, uh, everybody, they were, well, it was throughout the United States, the little people of San Bernardi, and they, I got statels made, I got uh, chess sets, I got a chess set made a of Jewish all chess Jewish, set. Jewish chess sets, the it's only the Jewish chess King set, rabbi. You got a minion? the only Jewish <laughs> chess set in the world. I got a, a rabbi and a Rebetzin, <laughs> and a Malamed, the and, queen. and a, you know, really and the a synagogue, yeah. and a congregation of little Yidlach. <laughs> they're the pawns. They're the pawns. <laughs> they're the pawns. Sam doesn't talk about this, but Sam, actually, in some ways, I mean, he's he's done things that, you know, the, the unique things, like uh, on Life, in Life magazine, he was the father of the year because he had taken kids into his house. Over the years, he took in 17 children. And he raised Foster them. children. And he raised them. Right. And mm -hmm. today, all over this country, you'll we'll get you know, phone calls and letters from kids who, who called me on a radio program on Larry, what's his name? The guy from Washington. Uh, whatever his name is. Uh, he'll kill me. If I <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Larry, uh, it's a talk show, and there's phone, phone ins. And I get a phone call. I said, yeah. You don't know me, but your brother is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. He's, he saved my life. Because, you know, these are troubled kids who came to his house. He raised them as mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, then life came down and took yes. pictures of him. Yes. Yeah. Do, you sell the, do you sell these figures, uh, Sam? These figures? Yes. Oh, yes. They've been sold all over the United States. And I know they're you... expensive, but they've been sold. <laughs> and you want good quality. Well, yeah, they're they're good quality right? For what you get, of course. No, there are a lot of people who have copied me now. You know, they... Everyone. They, they read like, the like yeah. who said it, everybody wants to get in the air. Yeah, well, sure. the, when they saw me, I was the first one to do make Jewish figures. Because I guess everybody was afraid to make it because of some Ever since Hasidic Mark, law. Yeah. And that also the that only... You yeah, weren't allowed to make, but since images. I was stupid yes. and I didn't know that, those laws, <laughs> true. Uh, I made them. And because I made them because of Fiddler on the Roof and the Yiddish Theater. And they start selling. And I sold the... Uh, well, that fiddling on the roof over there, yeah, uh, when he, no. he sent that to me, he sent me the first one. I was in the dressing room and I got it. It was just a shock. It blew me yeah. over. Mm. It was so beautiful. And Brentano's, the bookstore, mm -hmm. they sell sculptures and paintings, and they picked that up, and they, they, they made a contract. Yeah, full-time mm. ad in the Times. Uh, yeah. York Times. Uh, I know you uh, went on the lecture circuit, too, at times, to oh, yeah. uh, colleges and universities. No, to... I went to Jewish community centers and temples oh. all over... I did 14,000 miles traveling with my car for, in four months. And I, I intended to write a book at that time about the Jews that came to America in the uh, early 19s, 1900s. And I interviewed all these people, people and the stories, of course, that they ran away from the pogrom. <laughs> and, uh, and they came here, and they're all, they all became rich. I wanted to find people, Jews, that they were just ordinary working people. I couldn't find anybody. They all started here with junks, buying gold clothes, buying junk, and they all became very wealthy, <coughs> most of them. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. there's still quite a few people around. Yeah. Four people. Yeah, yeah but they, they're not the ones I'll, that came at the, in those days. Let me tell you something. Uh, well, we started with Jack. He, and I he wanted to, to write a book about about those those people. Jack wrote a book about our family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 
it's it's a memorial to the Yiddish theater. Uh, I'm listen. I'm proud of both my brothers. Okay, mm. but but the work they've done has been so meaningful for this time, especially for the what we call leftover people, the people who still remember those days. And the new generation doesn't remember anything. So it's, uh, I'm very grateful to you for mm. giving us the yes. opportunity to talk yes. about the Yiddish theater and about those days because right. it, it's uh, gone. Unfortunately, it's, it's been nothing. It's been my pleasure, really. I must say, I could we could go on for hours. I, I know because there's that much uh, to I talk just, about. I just wanted to say, apropos of what he was saying, <coughs> at the height of the Yiddish theater during the twenties, there were thirteen Yiddish theaters playing in New York. Every major city in the United States had one or two Yiddish theaters, and one by one they disappeared for various, various reasons. Right. Very important. I mean, it's very, yeah, very simple, the, obvious, uh, different reasons. But assimilations, reasons. you know. Primarily assimilation. Yes. Primarily, the, the, now there's a resurgence of people yes. wanting to come back yeah. to the Yiddish kite, as we say. And uh, if it happens, fine. Do you think it will happen, Herschel? I personally do not. No. There's well, no material base for it. So there used to be a material base for being a yeah. speaking Yiddish, for Yiddish yes, kite, for yes. Yiddish theater. But there's no material base left. The youth, the young people now, have no relation whatsoever right. to you know, Yiddish kite. In Romania, they have a state theater. They came here, the Romanian company came here, and I spoke to them. They play weekends there, and elderly people come down there. And the non-Jews, actors, they learn to speak Yiddish so they could play theater. Yeah. And they were telling me that it's disappearing there. Mm. And so, yeah. it, uh, Poland used to have a state theater, too. And here, the only place where they are playing theater is in New York, but they have a 10-week period where in the old days, in our days, you know, when Papa and Mama traveled with us, 36 weeks, and the stars from New York would, after mm. the 36 years, go on and be guest stars in the other in the other cities. So it would be a 40-week season. Yeah. It's gone now. It's gone. But where they spoke, yeah. they spoke clean Yiddish, you know, pure Yiddish. Now they speak mostly English. And I'll tell you Yiddish. one place where they speak. They speak Yiddish. Little enclaves in Canada. They still mm -hmm. speak. They have mm -hmm. groups that speak Yiddish because they don't have to conform to any United States kind of image. Mm -hmm. There's no image in but Canada. Not professional. <laughs> no, that's no that's what I mean. I'm talking about no. professional theater yeah. now. There's only two in New York going in. A 10-week season. Possibly. That's all. Well, that's we all hope. I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that I know you do. You three do, and I know our viewers also feel the same way that we'd like to see something, something come again out of the Yiddish theater. And uh, but the Bernardi brothers have had quite a history, and there's still a lot going on with them today. Uh, Herschel, in between performances, has found uh, the time to almost become a father again, I understand. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, it's uh, just a few weeks from now. Well, Sam has recently uh, married and is renovating his uh, house and working on his sculptures. And Jack uh, appeared recently at the Mark Taper Forum, in addition to other TV appearances. And our time has just gone by uh, so quickly. Uh, but I would like to thank you all. Thank you, thre three of you, for thank being you. with us today. It's be. really been marvelous. Really nice. It's very thank nice. Thank you very much. Very nice. And I thank you all for joining us today. Mm -hmm.